non-state actors so like uh, uh, terrorist group, uh, organized armed groups, and so on. So in uh, 2013, uh, the UN mandated group of government experts, uh, the GGI, uh, recommended that uh, international law and the, the, the UN Charter is applicable and uh, is essential to maintaining peace and stability, yeah, of course, at international level, and uh, promoting an open, secure, peaceful and accessible ICT environment. So uh, at the same time, of course, this is a very, this is a, a, a very important uh, statement of principle concerning the applicability of international law and of the UN Charter to the ICT environment. But at the same time, uh, it's clear that uh, new legal rules, uh, new legal principles must be also established and developed to address uh, cyber conducts, cyber situations that are not covered uh, by existing international uh, by existing international uh, law. So let's have a look uh, to a very uh, a very important uh, uh, general assembly resolution. Uh, I'm talking about uh, the, uh, the General Assembly Resolution number 27 that was adopted uh, during the 73rd session of the General Assembly on December, uh, fi 5 December 2018. Uh, this is a, a very important resolution because uh, it's a sort of uh, landmark in the long and complex process of building a set of uh, old and new legal rules for the cyberspace. And in fact, the, the resolution uh, lists uh, a, a set of rules and principles uh, aimed at defining scope and content of uh, responsible behaviors of states in the use of ICTs of uh, information and communication technologies. And uh, uh, it's quite important because uh, uh, a comprehensive uh, duty to cooperate among states is clearly affirmed, is clearly established by the resolution, uh, by the, the, the first section of the resolution, the duty to cooperate. And another important uh, aspect of this resolution is uh, that uh, the link between ICT conducts and international peace and security is also clearly established to the extent that the use of ICT may also constitute a threat or a breach of peace according to Article 39 of the UN Charter, uh, can trigger the Security Council Chapter 7 powers and can also trigger the right to individual or collective self-defense under Article 51. So if we look to, to the section of the General Assembly resolution concerning state uh, responsibility, we can find uh, some principles that uh, are already applied in the real world, uh, in the relationship uh, uh, between st among states in the real world. So in terms of state responsibility, uh, the principle according to which state uh, states should not knowingly allow their territory to be used by other states or non-state actors for internationally wrongful acts is extended to the ICT world, is extended to the cyberspace. And the same is true for some other principle like the one concerning the prohibition to use proxies to commit internationally wrongful acts using ICT and the duty 
to guarantee that uh, its own territory is not used by non-state actors to commit uh, internationally wrongful acts. So it's a, a quite comprehensive uh, uh, resolution and one of the most uh, important uh, part of this resolution of the General Assembly is the one concerning the critical infrastructure is a, is a very important point uh, in the latest uh, years because uh, uh, of course the right uh, uh, to protect uh, the territory from uh, external uh, threats or attacks is obviously reaffirmed with specific regard to critical infrastructure providing services to the public uh, because uh, it's really important because in the latest years, uh, um, one of the most relevant uh, and dangerous targets of malicious ICT conducts were critical infrastructure of states like medical facilities, financial services, uh, um, energy, water, and so on. So several sections of the resolution number 27 refer to critical uh, infrastructure and uh, there are a lot of recommendations uh, for states. Of course, we are talking about uh, General Assembly resolution. So this is not binding international law. Of course, it's not a treaty. It's not customary international law. So we can read some uh, important uh, recommendation that uh, they are non-binding for states. But if we take a look at the main uh, uh, recommendation contained uh, into the General Assembly Resolution number uh, 27, we can see that uh, uh, states are recommended to take appropriate measures to protect their critical infrastructure from ICT threats. They uh, can and they must respond to appropriate uh, requests for assistance coming from other states, they can take reasonable steps to guarantee the integrity of the supply chain so that the end users can have confidence in the security of ICT products and uh, least, but of course not uh, uh, last, uh, they have the duty to not allow or impair malicious ICT activity against another state's critical infrastructure emanating from its own territory. So uh, it's quite clear that in the last uh, 10 years, I would say 10, 15 years, the United Nations are playing a, a very significant role in uh, assisting uh, and helping states in discussing and developing the international, the new international principle and rules to be applied in cyberspace and to be applied to ICT conducts, ICT activities. And uh, we have uh, some uh, working groups uh, that were constituted uh, within the UN system, and they are working in the field of information security to advance studies uh, and uh, promote uh, debates, uh, discussion, consultation among states on uh, which is the best way, which are the best rules to regulate uh, cyberspace and related activities. Uh, let's take a brief look uh, to a couple of these uh, working group uh, that are working within the UN system. And uh, one of these uh, working group, the open-ended working group was established by the General Assembly in the, in the resolution number 27. 
and uh, this is a uh, this is an important working group because as you can see from the slide all the un member states are invited uh, to participate and uh, is uh, its first substantive report was adopted after two years of works uh, was adopted uh, 10 days ago. You, you can find uh, the link. Of course, uh, at the end uh, of the lecture, I will, uh, I will uh, post, I, I will transmit uh, my slides to the Voronezh State University so that uh, they can be posted uh, for everyone on the Powers website. So you can download uh, the, my slide and you can click uh, on the link if you are interested, of course, and you can take a look or study uh, this uh, final report that was adopted 10 days ago by the open-ended uh, uh, working group, uh, which is the, 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 the task, which was the main task of this open-ended working group. Uh, of course, uh, was to uh, the, the main task was to further develop uh, rules, norms, and principles concerning responsible behavior of states uh, and the better ways uh, for implementing uh, this legal uh, framework. Uh, yeah. Besides, another task that was. Uh, given to the open-ended working group uh, was, if necessary, to introduce changes uh, uh, to the rules or elaborate additional rules of behavior and to continue to study uh, existing and potential threats in the sphere of information security and possible cooperative measure to address uh, security threats uh, and uh, to study how international law can and must apply to the use uh, of uh, ICT uh, by states and uh, of course non-state actors. Uh, it, 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 it's clearly established both by the General Assembly and by this, uh, this, uh, this report. Uh, if we take a, a, a brief look uh, at uh, the main conclusion of the uh, of the final report, uh, well, there are some uh, very worrying uh, uh, conclusions uh, uh, because uh, uh, the, subs the the report uh, say that uh, uh, harmful uh, ICT incidents are more and more frequent uh, and sophisticated, and they are constantly evolving and diversifying. And according to the report, uh, the use of ICT in the future conflicts among states is becoming more likely. And another very worrying uh, uh, conclusion uh, reached by the, the open-ended working group uh, in its report uh, is uh, that the non-state actors uh, uh, to begin with uh, terrorist groups and uh, criminal groups uh, have uh, uh, ICT capabilities, have uh, ICT skills that in the past uh, were available only to states. So we have uh, a lot of non-state actors that today, presently, they are able to, to launch uh, cyber attacks, very damaging, very harmful, and this is a very worrying uh, uh, for state. Uh, and uh, you see that the conclusion are quite, uh, uh, quite comprehensive, quite uh, uh, important. Uh, uh, of course, the the, the open-ended working group underline that uh, ICT activities may have. Uh, devastating uh, security, economic, uh, social, and humanitarian consequences for critical infrastructure. And that is uh, very, very important uh, for uh, UN member states uh, to implement uh, and develop uh, cooperative measures among them in order to prevent, uh, 
and to struggle against uh, these uh, cyber threats, uh, in particular when coming from known state actors. Uh, another another uh, group uh, uh, working within the United Nations is the group of uh, uh, governmental experts uh, on advancing responsible state behavior in cyberspace in the context of international security. It's a, it's a very long name. It's a very long name for a group. Uh, it's another working group. Uh, in, it, it is is working in parallel in parallel with uh, the other open-ended working group. The the main difference because basically both groups. Uh, uh, essentially address uh, the same issues uh, uh, concerning cyberspace, international law, applicability of uh, old rules uh, of international law, development of new rules of international law suitable for cyberspace. But the main, the main difference is, is that uh, this GGI is working until the end of this year is composed uh, only by 25 selected member states. Uh, it's, it's chaired by Brazil and uh, of course the permanent uh, five of the Security Council are uh, taking part in the work uh, of, the, of the GGI and uh, we have also Australia, India, Japan. Uh, so uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of states uh, are taking part uh, in this uh, in this in this group and uh, so I, I think that it's quite clear from this brief reference that uh, the united nation is the main forum international forum where states can discuss uh, can confront their position in order to create uh, a more stable a more secure a more accessible ICT environment. Uh, but as I said, in the second part of my lecture, I would like to, to briefly address uh, two basic principles of international law, uh, because uh, it's quite important uh, to understand uh, uh, if these two principles apply to uh, international law and uh, how they apply to international law. Uh, a lot of scholars, you can see, uh, I, I refer to some of them uh, in the slides. And at the end uh, of the slide, you will find also some references concerning articles uh, or reports that you can search for on the website in order to study this problem. Uh, so uh, scholars agree that uh, states uh, in principle have already agreed that international law, including uh, the principle of uh, sovereignty and the principle of non-intervention does apply to state activities uh, in cyberspace. So, of course, uh, these two principles are among the most important uh, in the contemporary international legal system. Yet, how this principle actually apply is the subject of uh, ongoing debate uh, among states and among scholars, international law scholars, because uh, not only uh, the law in this area is uh, still unclear, but uh, states are also often ambiguous uh, in invoking the law or in how they characterize the applicable law. Uh, some scholars like Efroni and Shani, they have uh, underlined, underlined how many states uh, uh, prefer adopting uh, a policy of silence, a policy of, of uh, ambiguity in relation to their legal position concerning the regulation of cyber operation and uh, cyber activities uh, with a view to preserving high levels of operational flexibility. And uh, a lot of states uh, 
until now at least, uh, adopted uh, the so-called uh, wait and see approach concerning their legal position on the applicability of uh, international law on, uh, on cyberspace. So if we take uh, a closer look to the first of these two principles, uh, the principle of uh, state sovereignty, of course, uh, scope and uh, content of the principle of uh, sovereignty are wide and uh, really comprehensive. So as a matter of international law, uh, to be sovereign and uh, to have its own sovereignty respected uh, entitles uh, the state uh, to claim its fundamental right uh, to territorial integrity and political independence uh, against all the other states. Uh, this is quite uh, clear, uh, the, the content of the, of, of the principle of uh, sovereignty. So as a result, uh, at least in principle, uh, any unauthorized operation, cyber operation against uh, or within another state uh, should interfere or should violate uh, the sovereignty of the target state. Yet uh, the question, uh, the question whether any cyber conduct may violate uh, the target state uh, sovereignty is not so easy to answer because a state practice on this specific issues, on this specific issue, state practice is not still clearly oriented and uniform. So uh, we, we have a, a lot of different uh, cyber unauthorized operation in the world uh, because we, we can have uh, uh, cyber activities uh, that are very simplest, uh, very harmless, low level intrusion, intrusion with a view of uh, only knowing uh, the target states, but uh, at the same time, we can have a completely different uh, cyber operation, uh, very pervasive, uh, very harmful uh, for the purpose of causing damages, uh, distress, uh, fear within the, the injured state. So the, the reality is quite complex and the state practice uh, is not still clearly oriented uh, on this point. Well, if we look to the preamble of the General Assembly Resolution, the number 27, uh, the preamble is quite, uh, is quite clear because uh, it confirms that uh, state sovereignty and international norms and principles that flow from sovereignty apply to state conduct of ICT-related activities. And uh, also, if we look to the telling manual, the second edition of the telling manual, we can find the same uh, expansive approach to the applicability of the principle of state sovereignty. The telling, the telling manual, uh, second edition, uh, uh, was drafted and uh, edited, edited uh, by 20 international law uh, scholars uh, and with the, with the, for the purpose of uh, regulating uh, cyber operation by international law. Uh, of course, it's not binding. Of course, it's not binding for states, but it's a really authoritative and important uh, um, publication coming from the most uh, leading experts in the field of uh, cyberspace and international law of cyberspace. So if we look to the telling manual, it looks like uh, uh, it, uh, it has an expensive approach. So any, any unauthorized cyber conduct uh, is a, a violation of, uh, of state uh, uh, sovereignty. Yet, uh, has been underlined by scholars that uh, reaction 
uh, or by states to the telling manual were quite uh, strange, were quite uh, mixed because uh, many states took, uh, as, I, as I said before, a wait and see approach. Uh, some states uh, incorporated uh, in their national cyber strategy only some principles included in the manual, I mean, in the telling manual. And uh, some, sta some states avoided any reference to other parts of the telling manual, that is to say to other international rules uh, claimed and uh, written in the manual. So the reaction of state is a reaction very confusing, I will say. Uh, and many states took, uh, as I said, uh, this wait and see restrictive approach. Uh, and uh, according uh, to this uh, restrictive approach taken by many states, uh, well, most uh, cyber, most cyber operations and uh, cyber activities would only violate uh, the principle of non-intervention in domestic affairs, but they do not violate, they do not also violate the more general principle of sovereignty. So in, the, in this case, uh, a foreign state uh, cyber operation will be only unfriendly, but not also unlawful. Uh, on this point, uh, for instance, uh, the statements coming from the United States uh, are not uniform. And I will say that uh, statements coming from the United States are quite ambiguous. You cannot really understand which is their legal position concerning violation or not uh, of the principle of the state sovereignty. And uh, if we take a look uh, at this uh, statement uh, coming from the UK Attorney General, so a formal statement, an official statement, the UK has uh, a restrictive approach to the application of state sovereignty, because according to the United Kingdom, uh, the, 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 not all exercises of authority that are carried out uh, without consent of the target state uh, amount to a violation of its sovereignty. Uh, according to the United Kingdom, some of them are probably unfriendly, but they are not unlawful according to the UN Charter and according to customary international, international law. Uh, of course, uh, the restrictive approach of some states to the application of uh, the principle of state sovereignty seem strange, seem uh, at odds with the state mission of protecting uh, its own territory, population, and uh, critical infrastructure uh, from foreign state uh, malicious ICT activities. But we should consider that uh, many, many unauthorized cyber intrusions are not usually harmful for the target state. And uh, in addition, the lack of a binding clear legal framework uh, or at least uh, a certain degree of ambiguity on its scope and uh, content might guarantee states uh, uh, a certain degree of uh, legal freedom of action in, uh, conducted, uh, in conducting uh, cyber activities in someone else's house, uh, such as, uh, for instance, collecting data and information from foreign states' databases and systems. In other words, uh, I think that uh, at least for the time being, at least in this moment uh, uh, of international relations, states might prefer leaving a, a sort of a gray zone in the application of the principle of sovereignty. Uh, so in order to avoid, uh, 
to consider all exercises of authority not consented as amounting to a violation of sovereignty. If we look uh, to the other principle, the non-intervention principle that is codified by Article 2, Section 7, Paragraph 7 of the UN Charter, well, uh, I would say that uh, on the applicability of the principle of non-intervention in the cyberspace, uh, there is a, a widespread consensus among states. So uh, here the picture is, uh, is clearer, is, uh, is not so uh, unclear, is not so ambiguous as when uh, we refer to the principle of the state sovereignty. So uh, the principle, of course, uh, is well settled by the UN Charter, and uh, it was uh, also well defined by the 1970 uh, General Assembly Resolution number 2625, the, the very famous uh, Friendly Relations Declaration. In that declaration, the Assembly General affirmed the principle, uh, that is to say, the duty not to intervene in matters within the domestic jurisdiction of any states. And uh, in that 97 declaration, uh, the General Assembly specified that uh, uh, the use of any type of measures, any type means uh, armed measures, economic measure, political measure, or any other kind of measure. So, and the use of any type of measures to coerce, this is the magic word, coerce another state in order to obtain from it the subordination of the exercise of its sovereign rights and to secure from it advantages. Well, any type of measure of coercive measure is a strictly is a strictly forbidden by international law. So it's a very uh, there is a very wide application of this principle to real world situation and uh, to cyberspace interaction and situation. Of course, coercion, coercion is the magic word, <laughs> is the hallmark of prohibited intervention. And uh, also the International Court of Justice in the Nicaragua case, uh, in uh, its final judgment uh, concerning the Nicaragua case, uh, the International Court of Justice underlined that the principle of non-intervention is a part uh, of customary international law and uh, its, its exis existence uh, is uh, well established in the practice of states. But uh, defining uh, the exact content and the scope of the principle is not so easy. So uh, we can be sure that uh, the coercion is the main uh, aspects uh, because the element of coercion defines and uh, forms the very essence of prohibited intervention in international law. Sorry, uh, chiudete per favore i microfoni, ragazzi. So uh, I was saying that uh, uh, the element of coercion uh, forms the very essence of prohibited intervention in international law and uh, prohibited intervention must be one bearing on matters in which each state is permitted by the principle of state sovereignty to decide freely, such as, for instance, uh, the choice of its own political, economic, social, and cultural system, the formulation of its own foreign policy, uh, the operation of the parliament. And uh, you can read a very good definition given by the government of the Netherlands a couple of years ago uh, concerning what is coercion under international law. According to the Netherlands government, uh, 
coercion means compelling a state to take a course of action that he will not otherwise voluntarily pursue. So it's quite, it, it's hard to define the content, but we, we can say that uh, in general, the principle of non-intervention is uh, quite uh, established in international law, in the international law system. Well, a problem, uh, uh, we have a problem when we, when we try to distinguish between intervention and interference, because uh, uh, according to some states, uh, basically Western states, uh, uh, the non, uh, uh, when there is no coercion and you, all, uh, and you only have uh, influence, uh, that is to say a non-armed, non-coercive influence, well, this kind of interference is not a prohibited intervention. Uh, of course, interference may be unfriendly, but it's not unlawful according to the Western states. And uh, uh, according to them, for instance, the traditional messaging setting for a state position on uh, a foreign election is not coercive, is not prohibited by intervention by international law. If we look to the to the legal position, to the political declaration of all the other states, uh, I call them non-Western states. Uh, uh, any kind of interference in domestic aff affair is prohibited by international law. So according to a, a large part of the international community of states, uh, both intervention and interference are always prohibited by international law. So on this specific point, uh, there is a, a, a quite, uh, um, struggle uh, between Western states and non-Western states uh, according to uh, concerning what is prohibited by international law and what is uh, maybe unfriendly but uh, not unlawful for international law. So they are keep on discussing since many, many years on these two definition of uh, intervention and uh, interference. And of course, in the latest uh, years, uh, a lot of uh, uh, discussions were about uh, foreign cyber interference in elections. Uh, in, uh, I would say that in the latest years, uh, non-intervention was uh, uh, widely and uh, mainly discussed uh, by scholars and by states uh, with regard to foreign cyber interference in elections. Um, Australia, uh, you can see the definition given by a very prominent scholar, uh, Michael Smith, uh, is uh, one of the leading experts in the world concerning cyberspace and international law. And you can see it's uh, his uh, proposed definition uh, of uh, when a cyber operation uh, concerning uh, foreign election uh, is coercive. And according to Smith, uh, uh, basically any kind of cyber operation uh, interfering uh, with a foreign election should be prohibited because uh, coercive in nature and not uh, simply influencing or simply persuasive. Uh, the Australia, the Australia government in uh, 2019 uh, uh, clearly affirmed that uh, a cyber operation to manipulate the electoral system and the result of an election is a, a, a clear violation of Article uh, 2, Paragraph uh, uh, 7 of the UN uh, uh, Charter. So, uh, and, and some other states uh, support uh, the Australian position uh, uh, concerning cyber interference in uh, election. 
of course, the, the real point uh, is uh, to distinguish, uh, this is the point, is to distinguish uh, the, uh, the, the real uh, coercive uh, intervention in a foreign election from the simply influential or persuasive uh, influence. Because in this, in this case, uh, it, it could be a simple interference that may be unfriendly, but it's not unlawful. So uh, it, it's quite complex at the moment uh, to give uh, to, to to yes to give uh, a clear answer, a legal answer on uh, what is forbidden and what is lawful under international law. Uh, there is another point that we should. Uh, uh, think about that uh, uh, claiming legal attribution of cyber conducts to one state is very, very complex. It's very complex for many reasons. Some of them are technical reasons. So it's not so easy to claim a legal attribution of responsibility for a state uh, and uh, to take that state uh, before uh, an international court or an international tribunal. What we are looking, what uh, we are witnessing in the last year is not uh, uh, claiming legal attribution for uh, foreign interference. Uh, we are uh, looking at uh, interstates, the so-called political naming and blaming. So I put the finger against uh, that state because according to me, uh, there was a foreign interference in my election, but basically it's a, a political struggle. It's a, a political naming and blaming, but until now we, we have no uh, legal uh, uh, attribution of responsibility and, and so on, because as I said, it's quite complex uh, for technical reason, of course, to to understand the real situation. Uh, let's let's now uh, say something about the last part of my lecture concerning self defense. Uh, of course, uh, uh, states uh, agree that the UN Charter and customer international law apply. Uh, to cyber operation and activities. Uh, to begin with uh, the rules of the UN Charter concerning the use of force in international relations. But uh, we have a lot of problems in uh, interpreting and applying these rules and above all in uh, interpreting and applying the notion, the institute of self-defense to the cyber world, to the cyberspace. So uh, you can see here some questions that uh, states and scholars are asking. So what is a cyber armed attack under Article 51? We know from the International Court of Justice that uh, an attack is uh, harmed uh, and uh, when, because of uh, its uh, scale, because of its gravity, its effects. Uh, but when a cyber attack is uh, an armed attack. And the other problem uh, I will refer to uh, now, uh, when a cyber threat is uh, so imminent to allow the self-defense under Article 51, and which kind of self-defense we are talking about? Are we talking about anticipatory self-defense? That is to say, self-defense from an imminent attack, or are we talking about preemptive self-defense? That is to say, self-defense from a future, a remote attack. So there are some very important difference. Well, we, we can say that uh, in principle, states, UN member states support the view that cyber operation should be assessed, should be evaluated by traditional standards, 
applied to physical kinetic armed attacks in the real world. And this seems to be the best choice because it allows to extend, to apply a well-established body of international rules and international case law to the new cyber domain, to the new cyberspace. But we have some problems, of course, because uh, to define the exact scope, content, and application of self-defense from cyber attacks is not so simple. Uh, the, the Australian government underlined, and probably Australia is right, uh, underlined that the rapidity of cyber attacks, as well as their potentially conceal and or indiscriminate character, rises new challenges for the application of established principle on self-defense. So, okay, let's apply self-defense in principle to the cyber world, but to define the exact, the specific content of the right, it's not so simple because the interaction within the cyberspace are different from interaction within the real world. So the, the main problem is about uh, imminence in cyberspace, because uh, because uh, the imminence standard, uh, uh, if we look to the traditional interpretation of the imminence standard, uh, I mean uh, the one uh, that uh, was developed and that uh, is applied in the real world. Uh, well, of course, imminence means that uh, the armed attack is uh, really about to be launched. So when uh, an armed attack is about to be launched against me, I have the right to self-defense, of course, because as underlined by O'Connell, uh, of course, the imminent attacks engage the right of self-defense because a state need not wait to suffer the actual blow before defending itself. But the question is, the real question is, uh, the traditional imminent standard applied in the real world in the last century, in the last two centuries, is also appropriate in the modern, in contemporary cyberspace. This is the, this is the problem, because uh, uh, as a result of technological advance, uh, uh, the traditional imminence standard does no longer seem appropriate in cyberspace because a cyber armed attack causing large scale loss of lives and heavy damage to critical infrastructure might be launched in a split second, leaving no opportunity for the target state to effectively defend. So uh, Australia wondered uh, if it's seriously to be suggested that a state has no right to take action before that split second. And uh, what is uh, Australia is, uh, is a claiming, is a strongly claiming the right to act in anticipatory self-defense against an armed attack when the attacker is clearly committed to launching an armed attack in circumstances where the victim, the, the target state will lose its last opportunity to effectively defend itself unless it acts. So, of course, the, the reasoning of Australia is uh, quite logical. How can I defend myself from uh, an attack, a cyber attack that uh, could be launched in one single second? I must anticipate the right to self-defend if I want to really defend myself from a cyber attack. So, of course, this, this argument brought by Australia but brought by many other states, not only by Australia, as uh, some positive and negative consequences. 
Of course, the Australian argument is a sound because it uh, underlined the difficulty in uh, reconciling a concept of imminence that was uh, conceived and developed for real life situation with the new cyberspace where interaction are uh, uh, instantaneous, invisible, non-physical. But the problem is that as a matter of international law, if we accept this concept of cyber imminence, well, probably the very notion of self-defense will be upset. Because if we look to Article 51 of the UN Charter, the article uh, recognize the right of states to a defensive use of force within a comprehensive legal framework in which any offensive use of force is strictly prohibited. When I say offensive use of force, I mean any earlier response to threats not amounting to armed attacks or any response to attacks not yet or not really yet underway. So in terms of time and logic, self-defense from cyber imminent armed attacks would necessarily imply an offensive use of force because cyber attacks might be launched in a split second and therefore they are unpredictable by the target states. In other words, the state which fears or think to be the next target of a cyber attack would use the force before any attack effectively occur. And even if uncertainty remains as to the time and the place of the cyber attack. So if we look from this angle, if we look to the situation from this different perspective, the use of force by states in self-defense would actually have a punitive effect, a deterrent effect against the other states, not a really defensive effect. Of course, uh, and five minutes, I, I, I will stop so we can have uh, some question if you, if you wish. Uh, of course, in the last uh, 20, 25 years, expensive theories on self-defense uh, were advanced, were supported in international law by many, many states. Uh, and uh, most uh, basically after the 9-11, a lot of states started uh, uh, talking about a new a modern self-defense. Uh, according to the United Kingdom, uh, reality, uh, contemporary reality is completely different uh, from uh, the past. So, uh, since a long time, many states are claiming the right uh, to widen scope and content of the right of self-defense in order to protect from uh, especially non-state actors threats, either in anticipatory from imminent attacks or in preemptive from remote attacks way. So uh, what is worrying uh, about uh, these things, these expensive theories on self-defense is that according to these uh, expensive theories, uh, self-defense uh, is lawful even if there is no specific evidence of where an attack will take place or uh, of the precise nature of an attack. What do you, what do you need to lawfully defend yourself is only a reasonable, an objective basis for concluding that an armed attack is imminent, even if you don't know where or when the attack will take place. So it's quite contradictory if you, if you look to this uh, sentence. And uh, this position 
has been advocated is, and is supported by a lot of states to begin with the US and the United Kingdom, because this sentence that you can read in this slide was uh, affirmed by the former legal advisor uh, of the US Department of State. And it was also repeated by the former legal advisor of the UK foreign office. So it, it looks like the, there is a, a change of paradigm. Uh, maybe we are, when we talk about imminence in uh, uh, self-defense, probably we are shifting uh, uh, from the, a temporal paradigm to a necessary paradigm of imminence. Because according to the traditional concept, uh, the armed attack must be really, really about to happen in temporal terms. But if we look to the latest expensive theories concerning self-defense, uh, the armed attack will be regarded as imminent uh, from a different point of view, because uh, the, the imminence is no longer seen in a strictly temporal terms. So the armed attack will be regarded as imminent if responding to the attack is necessary now, regardless of when and how exactly the attack will take place. So in other words, is no longer imminent the attack that is really about to occur, to happen, but it's imminent the attack which necessitate immediate defensive action to successfully repel it. So uh, let's go to, to the conclusion. Uh, a lot of states to begin with Australia, United Kingdom, United States, they are expre expressly advocating the so-called modern law of self-defense that is founded on this expanded notion of necessary imminence. So the real question is whether this uh, modern law of self-defense is actually legitimizing offensive action for pretend preventing and deterring future threats rather than defending from imminent attacks. So probably there is a, a change of paradigm in this case uh, from defensive, real defensive actions from imminent attacks to offensive action for preemption, for preventing and deterring and punishing future threats. Well, when you deal with cyberspace and you try to apply the modern self-defense theories to cyberspace, the situation becomes much more complicated because unconventional security threats coming from the cyberspace are even more justifying the development of a modern law of self-defense. In this context, some feature of the cyberspace, its non-geophysical nature, its instantaneous interaction and so on, make it a particularly fertile ground for testing and applying those expensive theories on self-defense. So which is the problem according to me? This is one of my first conclusion. Uh, expensive, uh, the combined impact of claiming the validity and applicability of anticipatory, if not preemptive self-defense in the real world and in cyberspace might change the overall legal landscape on the use of force in international relation, in which we have been living since 1945, and which is firmly codified by the UN Charter. So expensive theories on self-defense applied both to real world and to cyberspace would end a legal era 
in which the use of force was regarded as an absolute exception. And the broad discretion states will inevitably enjoy in assessing when a threat, a cyber threat is imminent and when and how there is the need and the right to defend and fight back will probably make that once absolute exception the new general rule. So tomorrow the lawful use of force could be the new general rule. I think uh, that uh, probably the goal of uh, many if not most states in the present international community is to obtain a more legal leeway than in the past to struggle against unconventional security threats. So a more flexible legal framework is what they need to get room to address this threat and pursue their goals. So in a cyber world, such need becomes even more pressing and strategic for states, considering that cyberspace might be the best new ground for hostile and malicious interstate relations, because a cyberspace provides a great opportunity to fight each other in a more silent way and at a lower cost. So certain ambiguous attitude on how cyberspace should be regulated in international law. The complex issue of attributing, legal attributing cyber conducts to states. The increasing use by all states of cyber operation and cyber activities against other states are perhaps the best evidence of a future in which there will be a little less legal certainty on the limits to the use of force and a little more legal flexibility in assessing how and when the force should be used in international relations. So my final point is my final question is that uh, the, risk, the risk of this evolution of international practice, the, risk, the real risk is that more freedom of action for states, at least in the cyberspace, will increase in the future hostile, if not harmed confrontation among states. So uh, my lecture stops here. Uh, you, you can find my email addresses and you can also find uh, uh, my publication on this link that uh, you can see here. And uh, at the end of my slide, I put uh, some references, the references that uh, I recall uh, during my lecture. So you can, uh, if you wish, you can check it uh, and you can, for instance, uh, you can read the UK Attorney General speech, speech on cyber international law. Uh, you can read uh, a very interesting article about preemptive self-defense. Uh, and go on until the last. And you can also read the, the resolution of the General Assembly. So you, you can find all the link uh, that you need uh, in order to, to if you wish, to, to, to further study these aspects. Okay. Uh, I, I hope that uh, my, my presentation uh, was uh, interesting for you.